Okay, so my name is Megan Chu, and I am COO of Frenzy, which is a computer vision uh, startup based out of LA. So essentially what we do is create storefronts out of images. So we take um, computer vision and deep learning, and we apply that into images, and we can identify products that are in those images and allow you to buy them. So that's just like a really brief overview of Frenzy. If you want to talk about more about it, you can totally um, get me after the after my talk. So I wanted to, I felt like a lot of the things that I was covering in my talk um, have been touched on um, previously. So I wanted to kind of run through it quickly and leave time for you guys to ask questions. So um, first thing, um, I wanted to emphasize that here at Frenzy and like whenever we're building a business, the end user is still a human. Like whether you, whether your end user is like a business or a human, a person at the end of the day is still going to be um, the the user. So you don't want to forget about that human connection, even though we are using AI and sometimes we we get caught up in that. So um, just wanted to emphasize that the, there's the human connection. Um, and technology is the tool that we're using to help these people. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So, so obviously if you guys are here, you have some interest in AI or startups or business or all of that. So something that I've seen a lot of successful startups do is stay very close to their customers and do a really good job of understanding them. Um, and particularly giving them what they want. And that sounds like a really simple statement, but at the end of the day, it's actually sometimes really hard to fully understand your customer and give them what they actually want. So um, with that, like, don't get too wrapped up in your ideas. Like, I'm an engineer and I notice like a lot of engineers will only want to just sit at their computer and like code all day um, and not go out and talk to people. So I think it's great that Mark and Aaron like, encourage you guys to go out and really get feedback from people and talk to people and hear about their viewpoints. Because at the end of the day, like the people who are going to be using your products, we, we live in a global society. There's going to be people from all different cultures, all different age groups, genders using your products. So it's important to get their feedback on, um, on the ideas that you guys are creating, especially today. So. Um, this is just like a quote that I really liked. Uh, building something that takes a lot of time, money, and effort and doesn't work is wasteful. But what's even more wasteful is spending the resources on perfecting this you know, prototype and then realizing that no one even wants to use it. So um, just going back to the customer discovery and making sure that you're creating something that people will actually want and will pe people will actually pay for. So. <clears throat> How do you know what people want? Again, go out and talk to people. Um, and with that, really take into account positive and negative feedback. Like I would argue that negative feedback on your ideas is actually more, more helpful because it helps you, you know, cut out all the noise and narrow down your focus um, and get as many opinions as possible, again, with, with the whole diversity theme. Um, so with that, I wanted to give you guys a couple of questions to help you guys start thinking about some of these things that maybe you guys hadn't considered. So number one is start with a pain point. Whenever um, I start with a brainstorming session, I always think about like my own life and the people around me and think about what pain points I have. Like what problems do I deal with in my life or somebody um, that's like around me, what do they deal with? Um, and I think you guys did a great job of bringing up like seven key points um, about the gaps within AI. Um, so that that's definitely a great place to start. And then think about how big is this problem? Is it something that's only affecting you or does it affect people all around the country, whether that be students like you or people in your same age groups, people in your same um, culture. So think about how many people this problem affects. Um, these are some really good questions to ask. Um, if you're, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with like B2B versus B2C. So business to business, this means that your end consumer are other businesses. So me as a business, like the startup that we're creating, the people that we're targeting are other businesses. And then there's also B2C, which is business to consumer. So these are 
probably the things that we usually encounter. So like the person that like sold me this chair or this coat. So these are people selling to normal people. Um, so think about how many people slash businesses are affected by this problem that you've identified. Um, number two, would people spend money fixing this problem? Like how high of a priority is it for them to fix this problem? And would they spend money trying to do that? Um, three, how much money is being spent in this kind of industry, um, either with other um, competitors that are trying to fix this solution? Um, and how much money is being wasted because the problem isn't being solved? That's another thing that people often forget. So, um, and ultimately, is this a big enough problem to build a business around? Can you become sustainable? Can you be profitable? Um, or are you gonna, are you gonna keep um, burning money in order to keep this running? So um, the great thing about customer discovery, going out and talking to people, is a lot of the times you'll discover like tangent markets or other markets that you hadn't, dis hadn't um, considered before and realize that maybe this is a better fit for my idea. Or also a good option is realizing maybe my idea doesn't really work and then pivoting and that's totally fine. I know a lot of, I talked to John earlier, like your team has pivoted a couple times, we've pivoted a couple times. So that's totally fine. So don't stop until you think that you've achieved that product market fit. And then, um, this is like later on, like if you guys decide to take these ideas past the hackathon, like I know, like Michelle, uh, Trollbuster started out of a hackathon, right? Yeah, so um, going on that, like you have to keep innovating in order for your business to stay relevant. Like Amazon is a really great example of that. So they started out as a book marketplace, like an online book marketplace. And now, like you guys know, they have like clothes, they have groceries, I think they, Exactly. Yeah, I think they just like bought a pharmaceutical company. So that's the way that they're staying relevant is they keep innovating and um, going into new markets. <clears throat> so um, cut another thing about customer discoveries, a lot of the times when you're talking to people, they're going to be telling you like their problems. They're going to be telling you the things that they want. It's your job, like as intellectual people as you are, to figure out what they need. So I love this example of Henry Ford. So if he had gone out and talked to his customers, they would have told him, I want a faster horse. But he was smart enough to realize, no, they, they don't want a faster horse. They want to get from A to B faster and easier. So he used that knowledge and decided to create a solution, which we all know is the Model T, and it completely changed the game. So. Do a little bit of d deeper digging when you guys are going out and talking to people. Like really analyze what it is they're seeing. Is there a root cause like under what, um, under what they're telling you? Um, so there's that. And then the fun part, brainstorming. How can I fix this solution? And this is where I think diversity comes in immensely. I can really help you come up with a creative and useful solution. So the more people that you have on your team that think differently than you, the more perspectives that you guys can include in this solution and make sure that it addresses as many viewpoints as possible. And then um, I really like this framework of thinking about when you're creating your product. <clears throat> um, I think about it as, okay, state your hypothesis as this is the solution that I think will solve this problem. And then test your hypothesis. Go out and ask people about it. Get, your, get their feedback on it. Um, create really simple things like maybe sketches or outlines of how you think the product will work and get their feedback. And repeat this process until you come across, uh, until you settle on a hypothesis that you think could actually work as a product. And then um, test your product concept. So make sure that the solution that you've settled on is the right solution for the product. Um, and this is like later on, obviously not today, but if you guys decide to go on and pursue these ideas, test cost effectively. It's really, really expensive to have to go back, and Jimena touched on it earlier during his, her talk, but it's really expensive to have to go and undo your whole business model 
because you realize, oh, maybe I didn't hit the right market or maybe this isn't the right product. So with Frenzy, our initial target market are fashion bloggers. Um, and the pain point that we're addressing is curating affiliated links for the stuff that they're wearing. So our solution pretty much automates all of that. But in the very beginning, we didn't have any tech built, like nothing at all. So we kind of became like an outsourcing company for these bloggers. They would give us their outfits, and then we would just manually try and find these, um, the links for their products and try to figure out, is this actually something that's useful for them? Like, um, does this actually eliminate the pain point? And would they actually use a product like this? And that did two things for us. One, it made us really familiar with the pain point, which uh, better informed us when we were actually building the tech. And then two, it also helped us build a relationship with these people who would be our potential customers. Um, another great example is Groupon. You guys know Groupon? Yeah. So when they started, they were actually just like an email newsletter. They were just kind of manually putting in all of these like deals and then sending out sending them out to people. So just trying to prove the concept that people would subscribe to something like this. So in the very beginning, test out the product, test out your concept um, and do it cost effectively. Um, Vow to be chic is uh, a friend of mine in LA. It's a startup. Her name is Kelsey. So she actually won a case or a pitch competition when she was still in school. So she won, I think it was like $100,000. And so her investors asked her to make a budget. What she ended up doing was allocating like half of that budget to creating a really fancy website. And then her investors came back to her and told her like, no, that's not what we gave you the money for. We gave you the money so that you can prove that people will, oh, I forgot to tell you what the company was. So um, Vow to Be Chic is a rental bridesmaid dress company. <clears throat> so people spend millions of dollars buying bridesmaid dresses and that they'll never wear again. So she created this rental service. So her investors came back to her and told her, don't spend your money on a website. Like, we know you can build a website. Like, that, that's been proven prove that people are actually going to rent bridesmaid dresses. Spend the money on proving that. So what she ended up doing was creating like a really simple landing page and spent her money on like marketing efforts, trying to get interest from her customers. So just proving that her concept would work. <clears throat> and then after you do all of that, pivot when necessary. Verify that that concept works. And if it doesn't, that's OK. Like that's that's good, you know? Like, eliminate all of the bad options. So, and do it early, as I said before, because it can get expensive if you're having to go back and redo all of that. And then number three, something that some people forget about is this is a business. You have to be sustainable. So how can you monetize whatever solution that you have? And um, I'm happy to, to if, answer any questions that you guys have later on. Um, if, you, if you're having trouble with that as well. <clears throat> Number four is kind of like a competitive analysis. Who else is out there? Who else is doing this solution? Like, if it's such a big problem, if it's such a great idea that you have, why isn't someone else doing it? And chances are there might be some competitor, competitors out there. And that's not to discourage you if there are. Like that in a way validates that this is a valid problem and that it's worth working on. So look at what competitors are out there. How many are there? Um, what are the barriers of entry? So if there's too many, um, if there's too many competitors out there, it might be a saturated market. And um, it's going to be really hard to become the market leader. At the same time, barriers of entry are basically um, the, the things that you need to overcome in order to become you know, big in the, in the industry. So you don't see too many like airline startups. Because one, there's a ton of airlines out there. And two, it's really expensive to start an airline. You're, you're literally going to have to go out and buy a whole bunch of airplanes. So pick an industry or pick a problem and solution that won't have too many um, competitors and also won't be too expensive to prove. Number three is once you've identified these competitors, how are you better? Or how can you improve on their product? 
look at their weaknesses and look at how your look at how you guys can improve them. And then for sorry, this is um, also kind of like a, just another validation point. Have these people raise money? So. If they've raised money, that's a really good sign that this is a good problem to be solving, that um, investors and people who have um, ex experience and knowledge in this, in this field, they're pouring money into this. So maybe it is worth doing. And then um, ultimately, what you want to do is understand your, consume, your customer behavior because it determines like your entire business and marketing plan. So one example, so n once you understand how your customers are acting, what they want, what, um, what their behavior is, then you can know how to market to them. Then you'll know how to reach your customers. So for Frenzy, we're targeting fashion bloggers. So as a startup, we don't have a lot of money. So are we going to waste money um, advertising on Twitter? No, There's, the fashion bloggers are in, on Instagram. So it's things like those, like really understanding where your customers are so you as a business can place yourselves there. And then um, also understanding what your customers value. So speaking their language. So if you're a B2B company, if your end user is a business, make your value props things that they care about. So businesses care about their money, they care about their branding, they care about their customers. So when you're thinking about ways to market your product, think about it in those ways. How can I save my, my um, customers money? How can I increase their brand awareness? How can I up their brand? And how can I get them more customers? So really taking the time to understand what your customer values um, so that you can, you can best reach them and speak their language and best convey to them why your idea is so great. So with that, I just wanted to add, like, we're at a women's conference, and I wanted to um, emphasize that women have a lot of specific strengths. And one of them that I've just noticed in my own life is a lot of women are really good at being empathetic. And that, we've been talking a lot about empathy, understanding your customer, that goes in a lot with empathy. So use those strengths. Use, identify your strengths like as a woman, as a person of color, as a person from a specific socioeconomic status. Find those strengths and use them and go out and change the world. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'd be happy to answer questions. You all have your business models down perfectly. <laughs> if that's the case. Um, I guess one of my questions would be, at how detailed should our business plans be for, at this point, after a day and a half um, tomorrow? Like, should we be presenting numbers? Like, what, what kind of research do you think is possible in that amount of time for our projects? It will definitely depend on the industry. Like, some of them have more research, like kind of just publicly available. But I would say at least know how you're going to make money. That's probably number one. Um, how Have maybe a rough idea of the things that you would spend money on. Like if I were to invest in you, like, and I were to ask, like, OK, so if I gave you $100,000 right now, what would you spend it on? So I think that those two are probably the two most important. I don't know if you have anything to add, Mark. Yeah, I was just going to say that usually it's, you might give like a budget overview, like we want $100,000 and it's going to go to the, the salaries and the technology and all that. And then um, we're going to make money and here's how we see our revenues going. And we think mm -hmm. we'll make, we'll make, you know, we might be profitable by this quarter or something. And some people get more complicated, but it's, I don't think it's the details as much, but show what you can. Um, I actually have the someone from this last one, they actually gave out like a detailed plan and they printed it out and gave it to all the judges. They ended up winning, but that but there are other teams that have done that before and didn't win. So it's like it still comes down to your idea and proving it. Um, but the business is important in the plan. I mean, there have been people who've gotten spreadsheets with all kinds of crazy, you know, details. Um, but the research and stuff is still important. So it's every little piece is important. 
But um, yeah, and I'll, I'll let you see that one if you want, but there's, you know, you can do it however detailed you can get in the time allotted. And I might add, like, in the real world, when you're actually, like, pitching these startups, everyone knows, like, at this stage, none of your numbers really mean anything because everything is going to change. Like, especially in tech, everything changes so quickly. So it's more about um, that you can show your audience that you're thinking about the right things, you know. Yeah, and being confident in what you're yeah, doing. Exactly. So some of you also um, have shared that you're doing, um, oh, we're looking for a foundation funding. This is for good. Uh, non, if you're thinking even about a nonprofit, you still need to think about raising money. Having established my own nonprofit, this is important that you can't just rely on foundation funding. So you need to think more from a social entrepreneurial point of view of like if you're offering services in order to address the gap in whichever one you're doing, those services actually cost something. And if it's not cost, how are you going to get it through sponsor dollars or other ways? I mean, I'll, I'll put on, I don't know if we have a shared Google Drive or anything, but I have a, a PowerPoint that actually is tied to an Excel sheet to easily make you a template. So I'm happy to share that with everyone if they want that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the nonprofit because we, we do allow nonprofits, but you have, to, you have to do more than just say, we're going to get foundation funding. You have to be like, there's this specific foundation. We talk to a person there. We, you know, like really get into some details about which ones, how you're going to do it, how you're going to keep doing it. And most people have to do a lot more than just foundations. It's more a comment again. Um, one of the things that I look for as a judge is, do you understand your market size? So is there a there there? Is there a market with enough people with this pain point and this problem that you can solve it and make money? And so looking at, if you're trying to solve for rural health care or whatever the issue might be, well, what's the market? Where are the places where these folks are uninsured? How many uninsured are there? And getting those numbers helps us understand that you've done a little bit of that work into the financial. Great point. That's a really good point. Any other questions? Okay, so Megan will be here if you want to just talk about your own business plan or maybe just will do a quick round. Um, but now, basically, this is kind of the nighttime program, which is students all working on their own. Um, the facilitators will all be going upstairs for drinks on the fifth floor at the back of Panini Pete's. There's a little bar back there, so we'll be back there. And then at 10 o'clock, we'll come back down here and make sure to kind of have you all go elsewhere. If you want to continue working past 10, you're, you're, you can, but just not in here. And you're going to have to be up doing your pitches tomorrow. So what's that? Exactly. So you can, if you want to find another spot to keep on working or, you know, go to wherever you'd like to go, you can. But just remember, you'll need to be back here tomorrow morning. Breakfast is at 830. So we're giving you an extra half hour of sleep. Um, and then there'll be another talk, our last talk on how to pitch your startup, which will be really key. And then 11.30 a.m., have your, have your pitch.